the other thing to talk about, uh, I, I, I talked about this a little bit at the, at the start, was comparing like game journalism to film journalism because there are some interesting similarities and differences and the reasons behind those are i mean it's money but <laughs> <laughs> well i mean like you know both you know, the money is you know is, is an issue in both cases I think yes I don't. but you know i think the the, the, the it, it is very interesting to look at the difference because you know Movies and cinema is seen as more of an established, mature medium, whereas games are still kind of seen as the young upstart. Um, Get ready for a capsule. Where, uh, yeah, like, you know, it's still basically kind of trying to prove itself. Right. Um, the. So. I, I, I thought about this for a really, really long time. Mm -hmm. And. I mean, weeks of weeks and weeks I've been thinking about this. Well, and, and to preface this, like, you've actually taken classes on film criticism and... Film and, history, yeah. Right, right. So, you know, you're kind of... You're very much more an expert on this than I am, so... Um, and so... I, I started with just comparing the process that a game journalist goes through to review a content versus what a film journalist does to review content. And the first thing that I realized with what I've read about and what I've understood is a game journalist will play a game for maybe a couple of hours, you know, if that. They'll, right. they'll touch about, what, 10% of the game? Uh, on, on, let's say, a Bethesda game. They'll, they'll touch, right. like, 10%. It, it, it depends on the type of game, but yeah, yeah like, you know, like, generally they're not... For, I mean, it, to go into a little bit of the process, you know, um, from, uh, as I understand it, um, game journalists, I mean, like, yeah, like, you cannot play an entire game uh, and, and review it that way. I mean, there's just no way. Um, it's not know, enough like, time. It, Right, right. Even, even let's just say, like, you know, let's say it's a, it's not a, it's not an open-ended Bethesda game. It's kind of a closed again game. Let's say you're looking at like 30, 40 hours of gameplay, mm -hmm. um, and like, you know, and you've got, you know, five people, and you've got, you know, 30 games to review. Um, you know, you know, you know, you start doing that math, and you suddenly like realize, well, okay, like, you know, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna make some weekly deadlines, like, that's a lot of people. Um, that's a lot, a lot of hours are going to need to be put in in order to, have, you know, in theory, have a very complete review of a game. Right. And so they don't do that. You know, like, along the short of they don't do that. You know, they get most game journalists um, either play an abbreviated version of the game, they might get a development copy of the game that is basically like has, you know, like it lets them warp around and check things out, but they're not really playing things. Or they'll um, run they like a demo version. Right, right. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. They'll run a you know demo version provided by the developers. You know, obviously, kind of showing off the best of it. Um, and and this gets worse, like you know, when you start talking about open-ended games, or like you know, like the, the really bad culprit was MMOs. Mm -hmm. Because like you know, like it, when you have an MMO uh, at launch, like that's that's its own beast. Where you know you 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 have. Um, uh, yeah, you, know, like, you know, what happens at launch, you know, like, you know, especially a lot of the problems that MMOs tend to have at launch, overcrowding and things like that. Oh, I found a, uh, found a, uh, bonus room. Ooh. Lucky you. Yeah, let's see if I can... And, and yeah, and, like, how do you review an MMO at launch? Like, you, you review the initial leveling process, and... Like how how far do you get into that? You know, it's you get a very limited scope of what the game is. As as a reviewer, where a, a film reviewer, they they probably you know have some interest in the film. If not, you know, like they you know who the filmmaker is. You know what their style is. You know that who the actors are in it. You know what they're good for, what they're bad for. Hopefully, a film reviewer would know this knowledge. 
Like, right, right. Y- you have a, a very strong idea of what you're walking into for the film uh, with with very little details. And the, 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 the key thing is that the film reviewer experiences the full content of the film. Right, right, and, and and even beyond that, like you said, like you know, they might know the works of the, um, they might know the works of the the uh, the director. Uh, who killed the? I didn't even see it. Anyway, uh, yeah, and so yeah, like you said, they might know the work of the. Uh, the director, they might know a lot of the other things that basically kind of go into that. Um, whereas, like, you know, it's entirely possible a... Um, it's entirely possible, you know, like, a, a, a game reviewer can know that, you know, but, it, it, you know, it's probably one of those things where they, they would only know... Um, they would only know, you know, like, you know, you know it probably is just somebody famous if this is, like, you know, an indie game, especially. And, and yet, Stajara, that, that is one of the points that I will be making. The the difference between a reviewer and a critic. Right. Um, the, the biggest thing is that, for, for that argument, I couldn't actually come up with an example of a gaming critic in general. Right. And, and it w- within the the journalism mainstream, the the like as far as I could find, I I couldn't find anyone that made a particular example of that. Now in in independent um, environments, yes, there are game critics like YouTubers and um, people that aren't being paid by the you know developer ads. But as far as mainstream goes, I couldn't actually find a good example. Right, right. Where film I th- critics, I mean, they're, you know, all over the place. Right. Where a, a, a critic... So the difference between a critic and a re- reviewer, just for definition's sake, or, or for categorical st- sake, because I'm, mm. I'm not actually going into definitions here, because... I don't feel like looking it up right now. I'm busy. Um, <laughs> a, a, a reviewer is someone who simply reviews the content for the sake of distributing opinions, where a critic is actually giving a critical analysis based off te- technical and both subjective and objective criteria. Um, right. Like, even the best like film critic, like uh, Ebert, I, I, I looked up some of his reviews, and I noticed, you know, he tends to favor like very visually pleasing. He he likes fan. He likes. He enjoyed fancy aesthetics, like good CG, good, uh, you know, special effects, that kind of stuff. Like, he he would give a pass on his review on his criticisms. It, on a film if it had good special effects. So that's just one of his favors. You know, some something that he preferred as a critic. Which is fine, as long as you're clear about that. Right. And, and, and like, that's, you know, I'll get into this in a little bit, but, like, you know, like, I had a friend of mine that, you know, like, that was a big issue for us for game, for game reviewing and game criticism was that, um... The you never know what you know what somebody essentially what somebody's criteria was. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody could say, "Oh, this was a great game, and they did all these things right." Um, or you know, or, or I guess more appropriately, they could just say, oh, "Okay, this game is trash, and I really hate it." But you know, it's one of those things. Like if you find out this person's like a a huge first-person shooter fan, and they're trying to review a, a real-time strategy. And all their criticisms is like, why isn't this real-time strategy game more like a first-person shooter like I like? You you know, you kind of get a feel for that. You kind of like, you know, it, it adds to your understanding of the review. Oh, okay, well, you know, if you're if you're a first-person shooter fan and like, you know, you're wondering, oh, I've heard good things about this RTS, but is this something I'm gonna be I'm gonna like? 
well, that reviewer might be super insightful and useful for you. Mm -hmm. But if you're not a first person fan and say you're a hardcore real time strategy fan, um, that review is going to be trash. <laughs> you know, right. You're, you're going to have you know, completely different expectations and needs and desires. Um, and you know, again, like you know, this isn't to say that you know, like the review is terrible or you know, it can't be useful. But it is going to be a lot less useful for you, you know, in, in a more general sense, unless you happen to match the tastes of the reviewer. Right. So there, there's a little bit of a responsibility on the viewer or on the receiver of the review to understand the, the, the critic or the reviewer and understand what their tastes are. Right, right. And this is easier to do when you have something like a big name reviewer like Ebert, or what, like mm -hmm. what you were saying. Um, you can, you know, if you, if you kind of read his reviews and whatnot, you kind of understand. And, and we had a bit of this like in the old days back when we, you know, like back in, back in my day when they printed the reviews in these things called magazines. <laughs> um, nice. You should, you, you, know, you should continue the rest of the podcast <laughs> with that voice. <laughs> oh, oh, fuck no. Um, but yeah, but so when when you had you know like when you had review like you know you kind of had a kind of a re, you know st a, a regular group of people you know that kind of made sense that you were like oh okay this is you know uh, I forget some of the names of the people but yeah you know, like you know I used to you know I used to you know read like a try like trying gaming monthly and whatnot and like you know you 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 kind of you know, recognize their viewers like oh okay he's you know I understand yeah you know, his preferences here and it makes sense that he'd like this game and wouldn't like this game. And often they, you know, they do things like would have multiple people kind of review a game, give like small little blurb reviews, so you could be like, okay, you know, like these two people liked it, and I tend to agree with their their opinions more, and this third person didn't like it, and I I usually don't agree with them, so I'll probably like this game. Right. And uh, I I'm like that with uh, the film reviewers that I watch. Um, especially on YouTube, and I, I really want to talk about YouTube review, like film reviewers, because they're it's a totally different environment with them because they're not the the they they they're not reliant on getting premieres. They're not reliant on you know the filmmakers liking them so that they get you know access to access to everything. Things. They're they're literally right. fans who. The, the the particularly the guys that I watch, they're they're just fans that have watched enough film and paid attention and watched uh, film reviewers to to you know uh, have an articulated enough opinion to you know warrant listening to. But when I'm listening to them, I have to step back sometimes and go, okay, that's their opinion. I don't agree with it, but that's an opinion of theirs. And right. that's fine to not agree with them. Right. And that's the other thing I think a lot of people forget to do sometimes is it's okay to disagree with somebody on something and that doesn't make them a horrible person. Right, right. <laughs> well, I mean, and you just have differences of opinions, you know, like, you know, you might have, a, you know, in, in, in person you might have a friend who, like, you know, Maybe they like MMOs and you don't, or vice versa. Like, you know, or they you know, they they're a big first person shooter fan, but you know, you're like me, and you know, you can't aim very well, so you just play a Warframe that you know just lets you do AOE damage. Right. He says as he hops around on Ember. <laughs> right. But, I mean, I'm on Saren, so I'm not much. Better. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so, so we're both no skill people, but you know. Um. <laughs> But, but yeah, like, one of the movie reviewers that I watch, and I might get a little bit of flack for admitting that I watch, still watch them, because they had a big carfunkle uh, earlier in the year, um, is uh, the Nostalgia Critic on Channel Awesome. Um, uh, and that, that review channel is ran by Doug Walker and his brother Rob Walker. And, um... One of the things that I learned about them through watching their content is that they're big Dom Bluth fans. They they loved you know the Secret of Nim, you know American Tale, all those mm -hmm. you know those those uh, Disney movies not made by Disney. Right, right. And uh, so so whenever they start reviewing movies similar to those, they they tend to softball those reviews. 
Right. Because they're nostalgic for those for that content. I mean, it's a nostalgic critic, so they're criticized being critical on nostalgia, but they also have their own biases. Right. And then, you know, I'll read, you know, this particular gaming journalist that I've grown to not agree with and have a distaste for, and he'll be talking about Final Fantasy XIV, for example. And I'll go, mm-hmm. where are you getting this information from, guy? Like... Mm-hmm. Again, he's sharing an opinion. Right, right. But he's presenting it as authoritative. Right. Right. Yeah, it, it's like, you know, kind of going back and talking about, like, you know, how to how to do, like, game journalism right. Like, one of the things my friend did, and, you know, like, this is some years ago, um, but um, the way she wanted to, she reviewed MMOs, which was really interesting, and she had basically people uh, uh, write a blog. And so, like, you know, you would basically kind of write, and so, yes, you know, when you first start playing the game at launch, you'd be like, nope, the queue sucked, and I got on, and I got dumped, and I, oh, I went, nope, six star queue, no thank you, and then went and did something else. But then mm-hmm. when those problems, you know, when those problems clear up in a week, you know, you could be like, oh, hey, I finally got in, I got to play for three hours a day, and I did this, that, and the other, and the tutorial is great, and, but this kind of, I didn't understand the weapon system, and, you know, it's, it's, this is not very well explained, you know. And so you really got, you kind of got a uh, a good uh, uh, feel for like the game because you know it wasn't kind of bland generic you know oh no this is a really great game or you know oh this is this you know this Warcraft game made by Blizzard best thing ever um and, but it wasn't like oh you know, long you know, all day today and so you can't play and it sucks yeah, I, uh, I mean, for an example of that kind of experience, I mean, we can go back to uh, Final Fantasy XIV with the release of uh, Stormblood mm-hmm. with oh, yeah. um, Rob on Savage mode. Right, right, right. <laughs> Who will win? A server full of players or a one-armed guy that's not so good with crowds? Right. Oh, no, my uh, loading screen got hacked. Uh-oh. So, right so... Back and tell... <laughs> Uh, I, I was having them to drop some uh, argon crystals. I didn't get anything last time. I got one. Oh, you didn't even mark it. From I I was distracted. Okay. So. You mean incompetent? <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to get back on subject. Oh. Um. So. Right. Right. And so yeah, I mean that, that was a. Uh, that was a, a that was a temporary you know temporary thing but you know it was pretty major but it, eventually you know stormblood was more you know, you know now stormblood is obviously much more than <laughs> not Robon being able to get Savage, past Robon. So yeah. yeah right um so so being back on subject uh comparing game reviewers to film right reviewers. critics yeah yeah so one one thing that a film critic can do that a game reviewer can't, a, a film critic can watch the film again. Like I know a lot of film critics where they'll buy, the they'll they'll get a premiere invi- invitation, but they'll buy a ticket for a second viewing before right. they do their review. Right. So right. that and this is this is easy to do because it's you know, it's ten bucks and you know. Right. To buy a ticket. So, you know, as opposed to, like, you know, have to buy a game on another, you know, or, you know, like, say you want to do, like, a, you're reviewing a game that's on multiple, you know, systems. Well, buying the Xbox and the PlayStation 3 or 4 version is going to be costly. Right. Because in, in film review and film viewing in general, there's actually a rule of three that you, that, you, that happens psychologically. The mm. first, the first time you view a film, you'll you get an initial. You, it's been noted that viewers view the film emotionally the first time through. You're that's mm. that's when you're getting your your first reveal of it, and you're having your your emotional response to it. Mm. And then the second time you view it, you you start looking for details and you start mm. noticing things that you missed the first time because you were, you know, reacting emotionally. 
And then the third time you view it is when you objectively view it and analyze what you're watching. Now mm. that you understand your emotional response to it and you understand your detailed uh, viewing of it. Right, right. So there's some film critics that will see a movie two or three times before they write a review about it. Right, right. So they can get past kind of the initial emotional. That's interesting. Yeah, because like, you know, like a lot of... Uh... A lot of game reviews tend to be on that, that that emotional level, like, oh my god, this was such a blast, or you know, mm -hmm. like, it was just amazing walking to this thing in place the first time. Right. And uh, so there's there's a lot of reviews I watch that mm -hmm. will get past that point and they'll go, I really loved this part, but here's some things that I noticed about it that that I didn't notice the first time. Right. Um. And so, on that thought process, there is the phantom menace in, uh, phenomena. Mm. And this is a, a, an actual film thing where, uh, because there's such of a long delay between Je the Return of the Jedi and Phantom Menace that um, the Phantom Menace got, like, raving reviews on first mm. viewing um ebert gave it a 4.5 out of 5 right my marks are not getting crystal for you um because i'm not an asshole <laughs> thank you for interrupting me mid-sentence so i can't even edit it out you fucker <laughs> continue <laughs> um and so like ebert saw it and like, didn't even pick up on the pot holes. He didn't really pick up on, you know, the the fallacies of the movie. He just kind of had this very strong emotional response to the film because you know, it's the first Star Wars in, right. what, 25 years, I think it was? 30 years? I, right, I, right. I, a, a long time, yes. I forget when Return... That was, like, 81, 82... No, uh, was it? Yeah, because uh, Empire was like seventy-seven, and there was like two or three years right. between. Um. Yeah. Anyway, but so the point is though is that you know he basically went with the first viewing emotional experience. Right, and then so one and and there are a bunch of film reviewers that did this. Okay. And right. it's been, and there's been books written about this. It's really interesting to look into, but, um, there's a certain level of denial that everyone was going through because, you know, it was Star Wars. It was freaking Star Wars. Right. Right. And, uh, once, uh, the, once the film came out on, oh, New Hope was 77. I'm my mistake. I got, I got my films and my dates mixed up a little bit and I can't Google myself right this moment thank you for the correction Dejara. um i i appreciate your your fact checking me <laughs> um there the, so like one once phantom menace came out on dvd and everyone watched it again first off i should also note that phantom menace actually looks better on the on big film than it does on tv screen like just uh, the the amount of detail that you get out of a dvd release um mm -hmm. did not do the film justice it just looks better on the big screen on film and uh, there's a lot of films that are like that right um once everyone got to view it again and it w once the hype died down and you know the heart right. the heart pounding stopped like everyone right. started going oh yeah maybe, that doesn't maybe, make sense like maybe, maybe this isn't so good huh? <laughs> right right exactly and then by the time attack of the clones came out everyone started to realize that oh this this, this was this was again like you know a, a pretty you know a blatant nostalgia cash in rather than being a right and, and like everyone's just like oh maybe maybe it's just because you know it's the first one coming back and 
and maybe right. and they're just setting they're just setting up the story it'll get better in you know the right, next right, one right, right. and then the next one came <laughs> and everyone went oh <laughs> the classic fan denial like no no it'll get better it has to and, and then the third one came out and i went uh like <laughs> reality really set in by the time you got to you know revenge of the sith and and we're going through the same exact cycle now you know, With Force, the, the latest Star Wars movie. Yeah, Force I, Awakens comes out. Did, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to get on a Star Wars yeah, rant. I was going to say, like, it's, um, it's like the, 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 the thing now we're going to get on a Star Wars discussion every single... No, no. Dream. So, anyways. <laughs> no, okay. If we want the Star Wars rant, I'll do one t uh, Thursday, okay? You can right. come back. But, I'll continue but, this thought. <laughs> but I, I, think, I, I think it's potentially interesting because, you know, like, this is... You know, like what happened there is kind of what happens with games pretty regularly, right? Mm -hmm. Where, like, you know, you have these kind of beloved game, um, you have these beloved game, you know, uh, series and whatnot, um, um, and then uh, you know, and then it becomes an anchor. Like, like you, you were talking about earlier with the uh, the Zelda games. Mm -hmm. Like, how dare you lower, you know? the Zelda game, uh, you know, average score, you know, with your petty, you know, inconsequential opinion. When, when, you know, Jim Sterling, I think it was Jim Sterling. It might have been Total Biscuit. I don't remember. I don't remember who the reviewer right. was. Right. Um, uh, obviously just doesn't like durability mechanics in games. Like, right, right. That, that's their, that's their taste. Right, right. And you can't fault them for, as a reviewer for having this, you know, taste, even though it may affect, you know, the the on paper review score. Right. As a gamer, I didn't like the the durability mechanics, <laughs> and and right. It's sad. So so no so knowing about this, you know, like it was uh, potentially useful for you, but you right. Know. And and. Like, the interesting part about that is that there's a DLC to make it so that the Master Sword doesn't have durability anymore. And it becomes mm -hmm. a permanent weapon. But you have to go through this really hard DLC to do it. So then you're just like, what did they put in the durability just to include this <laughs> this DLC? Right, right. Um, so, like, that, that's interesting, too. Um... Uh, but uh, so uh, okay I did just think of one game critic on YouTube I haven't watched a lot of their content but it's based off of a film critic yeah um uh, have you ever seen I, I I think I've linked to you CinemaSins before yeah where where it's just a guy just rattling off every little nitpick he can find Right, right. Uh, there, yeah. There's, there's someone took his format and made it for gaming. Oh, yeah. Um, and uses like very similar nitpicks, and I'm just like, okay, that is a form of game criticism, even if it is a giant joke. Right, right, right. Because that, that's the thing with CinemaSense is that he's nitpicking, but like, it's, it's, a, it's all a joke. Because right, right. he loves the movies he's criticizing. He's right. just, you know jokingly being well you know let's put out all the flaws they have right right and even some of them the and some of them aren't even real flaws they're just him going well i didn't like that so ding right 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 um so so with all of this in mind, the biggest difference... Wow, this is the first segment that's going to go past 30 minutes. Wow. Um, <laughs> to, to sum it all up, the biggest difference between film criticism and game reviewing is that film critics are not being paid by the filmmakers to criticize right. the films. Dur directly or indirectly. Was that a rhetorical right. question or a statement? No, I'm well, just a statement, directly like, or right, indirectly. Right. Yeah, like, like, it's, you know, it's not. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think it's you know we shouldn't say like EA is cutting checks to game reviewers to give them ten out of ten. Right. 
it's just that, you know, like, it's pretty obvious, you know, like, you know, uh, there's a lot of kind of indirect benefit to playing nicely and, and giving good reviews to games, especially big popular games from big, po from big, uh, from big companies, so. Right, and wasn't there a, uh, I forget what game it was, but on one of the magazine websites, there was a point where they, um... They had like a huge banner for the game on the website, and I I think it was one of the Blizzard, one of the WoW expansions, and and like they uh, this, this they happen, yeah. yeah, this happened plenty of times. Yeah, like you know, like they do they the, the review the review is published the same day that there's a, you know, essentially what they usually call like a site takeover happens where you know, like giant banner ads and you know and and you know background has changed the theme of the game and you know, all that stuff. Right. Yeah, you know, it's like uh, exactly how impartial are these people if they're getting you know, you know if somebody paid a whole bunch of money to basically get the site redone in the the game's you know theme. Mm -hmm. Oh, where's the? I got him. Yeah. There you go. Life support on the way. Oh, there you go. Uh, he vanished on me. I see him. Hey, I hate that they can go invisible like that. Yeah, they move just super fast. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, so that's like that, that's the big difference. Right, right. I think, I think, I think that's important because that kind of ties into what I said before, like, you know, game reviewers are you know have this financial incentive to say nice things about large games which means you're not going to get an honest review of things necessarily and it's only gotten worse you know as uh as you know review as the reviews have gone online where you can have you know and you have a lot more blatant you know advertising for lack of a better word mm-hmm Oh, uh, so that, that was a good segment. Let's yeah. Deep breaths. <laughs> mm -hmm. Take a breath. Make fun of Malgram. <sighs> I know your life is so difficult. It is. I mean, you're such a simple person. Like, you know, coming up with new insults all the time. God. <laughs> no comment. I I I zoned out. What? <laughs> Case in point. Um. How are we on time? I haven't even looked. Okay, we're we're still good on time. Yeah. That, that's the thing with with Warframe. It's harder to look at all the screens. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of, yeah, looking over might get you killed. Right, right. Um. Yeah, I hope everyone's having fun. I okay. So Dejaro says.